I didn't hear anything you said. It's hard to hear up here, especially when you're uh, not talking. Well, good morning. We're all excited for ice coming. Prepared for ice coming, not excited. Uh, But it's great to be here this morning and know that there's no ice happening anytime soon, but we are glad that you're here this morning. And uh, this morning we picked back up in a series in James that we started a few months ago. We've taken a few weeks off because of the holidays, the uh, challenges that Pastor Weaver has given us uh, the last couple of Sundays uh, to really focus our hearts and lives uh, on Jesus, realizing that life is all about Jesus. And uh, I know that this message this morning really kind of ties in with that theme as well. But we pick up in James chapter 5. And uh, for those that maybe have not been here or just a little bit of refreshing, this uh, book of James, this letter uh, of James to the churches, um, we can say that uh, he is very direct, very bold, very blunt. James just says things like they need to be said, and I think that's why we've gotten a good response from people as we've gone through this, this book is that it just speaks right to where we're at. There's no beating around the bush with James. He just starts right off the bat saying, look, when tough times come, get tough. You're going to have to persevere through trials. And understand that trials and difficulties that come, uh, you're going to take joy in that because you know that it's doing good for your life. So James says, be tough in tough times. Consider it pure joy. He also says, stand firm in temptation. He tells us our actions have to match our words. Our actions have to match our profession of faith. He says to stop showing favoritism among one another. Watch your mouth. Control your tongue. Strive for peace in relationships. Get as close to God as you possibly can. And in the verse, uh, end of chapter 4, right before we pick up in uh, chapter 5, James makes this statement. He says, if you know what you ought to do and don't do it, what is it? It's sin. For him who knows what he ought to do and doesn't do it, to him it's sin. So it's not just things that we commit, but the things that we don't do that we know that we should. Now this message, if you uh, know chapter 5, we're going to start with the, uh, these first six verses, and uh, we talk about money today. And I would have to say that as we speak on this subject, like other subjects that maybe we, we talk about, it's real easy uh, for, for us, for those sitting, listening to this to go, oh man, here we go again. Not that we talk about money a lot, because we don't. But it's one of those subjects that it's easy already before I say anything, it's easy for you to start feeling guilt or feeling condemnation or saying, okay, I know I'm not going to measure up. I know I'm not doing what I should. Kind of like the message on parenting before we ever say a word, everybody's going, I'm a horrible parent. I already know that. And it can be the most encouraging, uplifting message about parenting. And I can tell you, my wife and I will walk out and go, we're horrible parents. That just confirmed in me I'm not what I should be. How many of you relate to what I'm saying? Okay, so here's what I want to ask you to do this morning. Because of the subject matter here, I want you to say, look, because here's what will happen. When this subject comes up, like other subjects, the enemy will come in and start bringing little thoughts of guilt and doubt and condemnation and excuses, and all those are tools that he can use to keep you from being where you need to be. And it has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with dollar amounts. It has nothing to do with any of that. He has a way of getting in because we're in a spiritual battle. The Bible tells us that that this physical thing about money, it's really got a spiritual background to it. And uh, so I want you to battle through this this morning and realize that um, the enemy can use this to, to control us. We know that money is one of those things. It's a powerful thing. What, what is the phrase people say, money talks? And there's an old song, I'm trying to remember who it was, I know that Willie Nelson, um, Willie Nelson recorded it too, if you, got, if you got the money, honey, I've got the time, meaning, you know, you got, you got a certain amount of money, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, I'm in. You, 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 you pay and I'm there. So money is a powerful thing, and, but I want you to listen, and really this morning, just 
uh, before we get started with anything, even reading scripture, just say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come with an open heart. And I'm going to listen to the Lord. And I'm going to say to myself, what is it that you want me to hear this morning? And then be obedient and respond, whatever that is. So James chapter 5, verse 1, he says this, Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You think James is being blunt and direct? You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. So if we look back to the first century um, Middle Eastern culture, wealth was measured by three, by three things. It was measured by your grain, your garments, and your gold. So it's food, clothes, and your metals or, or precious jewels. You see, these rich people had so much food that it was rotting. It was getting eaten up by maggots. They had a lot of fancy clothes that were filled with holes because of moths. And their gold and silver had lost their luster because they were buried under all the other stuff that they had accumulated for themselves. Now, it's easy for us to say, okay, this passage of Scripture is talking to specific people. And first of all, it says rich. And you can say, well, I'm not rich, I'm not a business owner, and even if I am a business owner, I don't treat my employees that way. So what we, it's easy for us to let ourselves off the hook and say, that doesn't even apply to me. What's the point? Well, the point this morning is that there are principles throughout Scripture, no matter what passage it is, that apply to our lives uh, throughout Scripture, where we ask ourselves, what is, what is it that I can gain from this? What do I take away? How does this relate to me? And here's the deal. Compared to the rest of the world, every single one of you are rich. You have way more stuff when we talk about needs, way more stuff. We in America do not live like the rest of the world. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You've been to another part of the world. Some of you grew up in another part of the world. How we live in America is not like the rest of the world. So by the rest of the world standards, every single one of you are rich. We have so much stuff. So much stuff. Did you know that the average American owns 2.6 credit cards? that the average American household has $5,700 in credit card debt. Now, understanding there are people who use credit cards that pay it off each month, the, those who are indebted, meaning they carry a balance on their credit card, the average for them is $16,000 of credit card debt. That just tells you, you know, we're, it, it tells you a lot of things. But we're about stuff. Housing. The average house in America in 1973 was 1,600 square feet in size, 1,600 square feet. In 1983, that had gone up to 1,725, so it increased uh, a few, a few uh, like 100 square foot in about 10 years' time. In 2013, 40 years later from 1973, the average American home is over 2,600 square feet. So what does that tell us? They, they have grown a lot. We've got more space. We've got more rooms. We've got more storage to keep our stuff. We have garages that are filled with stuff. We've got basements filled with stuff, storage rooms, closets, sheds. And do you know that one of the biggest, one, one big industry in the United States that just kind of shocked me, but 10% of Americans actually rent an extra storage space. Self-storage, 10% of Americans use some form of self-storage. There is actually 2 billion, 2.63 billion square foot of self-storage space in the United States. 
$32.7 billion revenue just on providing storage for people to store the rest of their stuff off-site in another place. Tell me we don't have stuff. Okay, the whole guilt part thing, you see where it's coming in? I don't want, I don't want us to feel guilty this morning. I just want us to take inventory. And I'm not saying let ourselves off the hook. I'm saying let's listen to what God would say to us about priorities and about money and about stuff and about what those things are, are, are the place that they're to take in our life. So compared to the rest of the world, we're rich. James is talking here about the worthlessness of riches, not the worthlessness of the rich. All the money that we have, all the accumulation of things that we have, what is it going to be worth when Jesus comes? When Jesus returns to take all the Christians, all the believers, the church to heaven, what do you think all that's going to have value to you? Whether you're here and you miss that, if you go to heaven, it sure doesn't have value. If you're here, guess what? It's not going to mean a whole lot to you. So put that in perspective. What should we spend our time accumulating? What kind of things are worthwhile in light of eternity? Money is not the problem. We need money. We need money to live. We need money uh, to support our families. We need money to, to spread the gospel. We need missions. We, we're doing work in this community. It's, it's not money that's the problem. Paul said it's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. So God holds us responsible for what he provides us. You see, throughout Scripture, we also see that what we have as Christians, we ought to see it that what we have is not, what I have is not what I've been able to accumulate for myself. Scripture says over and over that what I have has been supplied by God. God is the giver of everything that we have. Take some time, if you will, um, this week. Turn to, um, turn to First Chronicles. Let me just say say this before, uh, before I get too far. King David at the end of his reign and Solomon is getting ready to be uh, installed as king to take his place. Here's just a few thoughts from um, 1 Chronicles 29. And I just highlighted this. Go back and read this passage. It's a prayer of David at the, end of, at the end of his reign. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours. Wealth and honor come from you alone for you, God, rule over everything. Everything we have comes from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. It all belongs to you. I know, my God, that you examine our hearts and rejoice when you find integrity there. You know I have done all this with good motives. I've watched your people offer their gifts willingly and joyously. So just like King David and throughout Scripture, we come to this understanding that what we have really is a gift from God. The abilities that we have to make the money and the ways that it comes, and he supplies all of our needs. That's his promise. So if we're, if we're a believer in Jesus Christ, we have, to, we have to sign on to this idea that what we have really comes from God ultimately. Do we trust that he is going to be our provider? Do we trust that he can take care of our needs? We sang a song earlier that said, he's, in, he's, a, he's a God who does impossible things, and he's unstoppable. There's nothing that God can't do. And so for us to think that, you know, we got to put our hope in money and our trust in money and not in God, not a lot of faith. Let's put our, put our faith, our trust in God. Go back and read that. It's a, a great passage of Scripture. So here's, here's what I know. In this world, this passage is talking about rich, rich people and obviously greedy people. There is a lot of rich, greedy people in the world. But here's what, here's what I've come to realize there's a lot of greedy poor people. It really has nothing to do with a dollar amount in your bank account or what you have. A lot of people are jealous of what other people have. And they'll go and buy things that they don't have any business buying or that they don't have the money to buy just so that they can kind of keep up because they're looking for uh, things like status and stuff to make them happy and fulfilled. So it's not about stuff, and it's not about money. It's about where is our heart? Where does our heart lie? Where do we put our trust? So James's message is direct uh, to, these, to these arrogantly wealthy people, and we can lump ourselves into that uh, because the message, uh, uh, it's a message that all of us need to hear, that all of us need to respond to. It's easy for us to stop, just kind of skip over some passages and go, well, that's talking to greedy rich people. That's not me. Well, is there a principle that applies? 
I think that there is, and there's a couple of questions that I want to ask us this morning just to uh, take some inventory. And the first one is, how do I handle wealth? Ask yourself this question, how do I handle my wealth? James isn't, isn't condemning for people for being wealthy, uh, but for how they're handling what God has given them. Like I said, it's not a, so much about what we possess, but what we do with it that matters to God. 2 Corinthians 8, 12 says it doesn't matter how much you have. What matters is how much you're willing to give from what you have. So how do I handle my wealth? It's a challenging question uh, to us as Americans. We take inventory of our own life. And, and here's a few questions under that question. Uh, the first one I want to ask you is, am I hoarding? Am I a hoarder? Or am I generous? James said, your wealth is rotted, the moths have eaten your clothes, your gold and your silver, they're corroded, the corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You've hoarded wealth. They had so much that they couldn't even use it all. And what they had was being destroyed. So I think about this, what we have, we have closets full, we've got storage rooms full, We've got self-storage units full. We've got stuff everywhere. What do I have? Is it really for me, or can I use what I have to share it with others? So while I look at it as mine, I, I got to look at it and say, it, is it for me just to keep for myself, or especially so much of it that I don't use? Can I give it to bless other people? And should I be storing things that I'm not really using? How many of you got closets full of clothes? Okay, I, I kind of shared this at the end, and I told it on my wife when she wasn't here, and now i got to tell it in her presence because she doesn't even know what I said. But this is what happens, and, and I say this because she, she had her daughters and her daughter-in-law in on this, on this project, but our closet, we have a walk-in closet. I remember when we built our house 16 years ago, I thought, this closet is the size of a bedroom. It didn't have anything in it. And you know what? I'm thinking, we'll never fill this thing up. Why are you laughing? <laughs> you have closets too, right? So Jeannie got uh, Mackenzie and Brianna and Marin, and it was over Christmas break, and she said, I want to clean out my closet. And she pulled out all of her clothes and went through all of it and had them decide, keep, not keep, keep, what's, you know, what's way, way old. Mackenzie thinks if it's two years old, it's way out of date. Maybe 20, 30, I don't know. But how many bags did we take to Encore, Jeannie? Six. I said 10 in the first service. It seemed like 20, but it was a lot. Just six bags that, and guess what? There's still plenty of stuff in our closet. Probably still more than we need, and I got to do the same thing. But, but, but we look at our stuff. Is it for me? Or do we look at it to say, God has blessed me, not to bless myself, but maybe to bless others? Our perspective shouldn't be how much money am I going to, am I going to, uh, of my money am I going to give to God, but how much of God's money am I going to live on myself? Here's the deal. Before you start feeling guilty, I want to, I want to just say, and we say this all the time, you are a great, generous church, a giving church. The way that you give time, you give your talents, your abilities, you give of your treasures. I, I think of all the things. We go through all the ministries and different things that people do around here. Just this week, we had on Monday like 12 people show up to put Christmas decorations away. I'm so thankful that's not, that's not just a pastor's job to do because I would probably not wake up that day if I had to put Christmas decorations away. But there's people, that's, that's, a, that's what the things that they love to do. Uh, people that use their talents in music or teaching or using their trades, giving of their treasures. I don't know if you noticed in your bulletin, we didn't announce it, but do you realize that this church, the youth of our church with the help of the adults here, almost $151,000 for Speed the Light this year. That's incredible. Yeah. Our kids did an incredible job. You did an incredible job getting behind them, just, just like the dollar blessing that we took this morning. Regularly, we give dollar blessings to, to help encourage and bless other people. And you give out of that, and I've never heard anything but just thankfulness for the opportunity to do that, to bless one another. So I, I'm saying this all in the context of saying we're a, we're a caring, giving, generous church. But here's the deal. Those, while those things are great, if we all live by the principles and said, look, I'm going 
to trust God with everything. I know that those amounts would be exponentially, exponentially higher. And I'm not, trying, I'm not fundraising here. We don't need money. I'm not asking for money. All I'm saying is we got to approach this like every other thing in life. God, what do you want me to do? There's obviously something that, that God wants us to hear as it relates to our finances and money because the first three uh, chapters or the first three books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, one out of every six verses deals with money and finances. Jesus talked a lot about money because he knows that money can really capture our heart. Money is one of those things that, that the enemy can dangle out in front of us like a carrot. And next thing you know, we're just, we're just following along. Randy Alcorn said that, that God prospers me not to raise my standard of living, but to raise my standard of giving. God blesses us so that we might be a blessing to others. Billy Graham said, God's given you two hands, one to receive with, another to give with. We're not cisterns made for hoarding. We're channels made for sharing. The Apostle Paul said it like this to young Timothy. He said, 1 Timothy chapter 6, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything. There it is again. God is the giver of every good thing for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasures as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. We're to be investing here not in temporary things, but we're to be investing in eternal stuff. We're to be laying up treasures in heaven. What do you think that your investments today are going to be worth in in 100 years? You're saying, I don't care. I'm not going to be here. Right. What is your investment going to be worth in 1,000 years? Even more crazy. What about 30 million years from now? What is your investment today going to be worth then? You're going, that's so far out there, and I'm saying exactly, guess what? Your investment in eternal things in 30 million years is still gonna be bringing dividends. Does that make sense? Don't put your treasure here on earth and be tied down and stuck to earth. There's an eternal heaven that is, that, that is the life that is truly, truly living. No matter, how, no matter how much money you have, our life should demonstrate that God controls it all. He's the giver of it all, and he ought to have control of everything we possess. Am I a hoarder, or am I generous? The second question is, do I care about how I treat other people? This isn't just a message about about money. It affects how we treat other people. See, James is addressing this issue, and he says, the wages that you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields, they're crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You see, the landowners in that day, they would hire the laborers in, and the custom thing was to pay them at the end of the day. And then they would take their paycheck, go to the store, get some food, or wherever they went to get food, take it home, and that's what they had to eat that night. And so if the landowner is not paying his workers, guess what? They don't eat. And he's saying, look, it it comes down to, it affects the relationships of people. It's so easy for us to get off course in life, to lose sight of where we're going. And I think about this in in the whole driving thing. We're We're in a new day and a new age with cell phones and texting and all the things that our cell phones can do. I just want to ask for a, 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 a voice of honesty here. How many of you have ever texted and driven? Okay, we don't have any police standing back there arresting you on your confession today. But the reality is it's a temptation, right? There you go. There's a picture of it. Texting and driving, you take your eyes off the road for just a second or two, and how many of you know it's easy to get off course? Okay? There's a reason why it's illegal. Some people, they they compensate by doing this. See... I got somebody else with me that can just drive while I'm texting behind the wheel. Anybody guilty? Okay, you, this is, you, you know what I'm talking about. And, it, and, then, and then maybe just because of the rush of things, you, you might end up doing this while you're driving. Um, anybody there? Okay. 
So you got texting, you've got eating, and you might even be doing, um, doing, your, doing your makeup while you're doing all of that. I've seen people in the car shaving. I've seen ladies doing eye makeup in the car. It happens. But here's the deal. There's a reason why those things are illegal because just a little bit of taking your eye off the course and eye off the road, then you're going to end up in a ditch. When I was in high school, I didn't have a cell phone. We had a phone with a 25-foot curly cord on it. I, it was the big 25-foot curly cord that was the big thing when I was in high school. We could actually talk on the phone and take it from one room to another. How many of you know what I'm talking about there? Okay. So um, in high school, my very first car was a 1976 baby blue Ford Pinto. This is not actually my car, but that is exactly like my car. It wasn't parked near the beach. I, I, this was in Oklahoma. So just a few weeks after I got my own car and I was driving my car, it was a Friday night. It was cloudy. Uh, looked like a storm was coming in, and I was heading into town. We lived about four or five miles outside of town, and I'm driving along the road heading into uh, the, the football game on Friday night. And um, as I'm driving down the road in my car, I'm hearing, I'm hearing a noise. I know it's windy out, but I'm hearing a noise like my door is not shut all the way, okay? So you don't have to stop your car and pull over to open the door, although it probably recommended. Uh, you know, so I did one of these things, you know, you got, you got your knee against the steering wheel, and I'm opening the door and slamming the door shut as I'm driving down the road. And driving a little bit, and I realized that didn't really take care of it. So I grabbed the, roll up the window. This was, this was the window on a 76 Pinto. How many remember those? Okay. So, and I'm leaning across the other side, and I'm, you know, making sure that that window's rolled up. But I know the sound's coming out of my left ear, and I'm going, what in the world is going on? And I'm serious. Not two or three seconds of, of this, looking to see where is that and it was like, boom! And that's the last thing I remember for several seconds. The next thing I remember, I'm turning down the road to my house on a gravel road, and it's down the road to my house. And as I'm driving down that road to my house, all of a sudden, it's like I'm realizing my windshield is like caved in. And I'll, I'm thinking, what, what happened? I, look, I looked in my rearview mirror. I don't have a back window in my Pinto. My window's caved in. And I, all of a sudden, I'm panicking. I'm like shaking, going, what happened? I don't know what happened. I'm pulling in the driveway. My dad's in the driveway. And he comes out, and he's all in a panic. He's saying, what happened? And I have no idea. I just remember there being a sudden thud. And several seconds later, I'm, I'm automatically somehow driving home in my little four-speed my little four-speed car. So we hop in my dad's truck and we drive back down the highway and I'm thinking, I could have hit another car. I could have hit a person walking on the side of the road. I might have hit a cow. I have no idea what happened. I'm, I'm just, it's just that phase of what in the world has gone on with me. And we get down the street and all of a sudden I realized there was a bank of mailboxes alongside the road. And I had taken out Every single one of them. I think there were six of them. The problem was one of them was on a steel post about that big around. The mailbox had been encased in steel and cemented in the ground. I think this might have happened to somebody before. They got their mailbox knocked down, and they were making sure it didn't happen again. And so we pull up, and I'm, I'm a little bit relieved that it's just mailboxes, but there's a guy uh, who is a, a year or two older than me in school, and he's sitting, they had a long driveway, there's several houses down there, and he's just sitting there looking at, at the road. And I, I, I get out, and he said, there's supposed to be mailboxes there. And I said, I, I know, I, I hit them. I, I, just two seconds of not looking at the road, and that's what could have happened. It could have been much, much worse. But the point is, I, you know, I had driven down. I, looked, I saw my tracks. I had driven down in the, in the ditch and turned around up out of the ditch and headed home. My, my back window was laying in the ditch right there. I just picked my window up and put it in my car. But the point is this. It's easy just for a second or two to, to lose sight of the goal of the direction of the course that we're on to get way, way off track. 
And that's kind of how money and riches and things like that can get us off track of what really we should be doing. In the book of Malachi, it talks about it. The people in Malachi were in a similar situation with what James is addressing, that the people were drifting away from God. And it showed up in different areas of their life, especially how they treated people and how they handled money. Like James was addressing, they were cheating employees out of wages. They were oppressing widows and orphans. They weren't honoring God. God had been faithful to them, but they weren't faithful to him. And as a result, they weren't respecting one another. And they were using people for all kinds of selfish reasons. They had strayed away from God and his instructions to them on their finances. You see, God gives us people to love and money to use but we so often get that backwards. They were too possessive of their money. Paul said it's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. In Malachi, they weren't bringing God's tithe. They they weren't giving offerings. God said, you're robbing me. In Malachi chapter three, verse eight, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me, God says. But you ask, how are we robbing you? And God said, in tithes, and offerings. You're under a curse. Your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it or to store it. He talks about, he took, talks about tithe. Some of you may not even know what that means, or some of you know what it means, and it just seems like a, one of those scary words. It's like, uh, you're going to bring up tithe, right? All tithe means is 10%. And God is saying it's, it's 10%. That's what I asked. And, and it talks about paying tithes and giving offerings. When we, when we receive an offering here, we'll talk about bringing God's tithes. It's not our tithes. It's God's. And we've got to put that in perspective. It's not about fundraising or anything like that. It's about saying, look, I'm, I'm keeping it all in perspective. I want to keep it in the perspective that God has for, for me, for my life, for my blessing, to keep it all in the right priority and perspective and saying, a percentage of this is God's. And I'm just saying, that's it. And, and, and some of you may, may not even be there. Maybe it's the first time you've even heard about it. Or maybe you've said, you know what, at, at some point in my life, that's what I plan to do. And I would challenge you to say, whatever, whatever phase of that you're in, start now. You may not be able to give 10% right now. You've got a lot of credit or different things. Take care of those things and then make sure that God has his part. And it's like, we, if we look at it like it's my money and I'm going to give God part of it, or we look at it like it's God's money and I'm going to live on part of it, which is the better perspective? If God is the one who supplied everything, They hit people of Malachi's day, they'd love God and not money. They would have been willing to let go of a lot more of it and be obedient to God. And it's the same, same is true of us. We tend to hold on to our money and love it more than God. We tend to use it selfishly on ourselves. A lot of things that we don't really need. We're caught up in a culture where there the messages out here are telling us you got to have this, you got to have this newest thing, you got to have, and, and it's an endless pit of things and stuff. And again, hear me, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have things, but do we have storehouses and stockpiles? Uh, and are we really truly trusting God with it and giving Him that place in our life? There are consequences for using people and loving money. Any kind of disobedience to God has consequences. But God gives us this promise that if we will do this, it's the only time in Scripture where he says, test me and see. The New Living Living Translation says, "Try try try it out. Test and see if I'm not going to just pour out a a blessing on your life as a result that there's not room enough for you to receive or store everything that I'm going to give you. Billy Graham said it, one hand to give, One hand to receive, another hand to give. So the third question under this is, am I living selfish and self-indulgently? James said, you've lived in luxury and in self-indulgence. You've fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. To live self-indulgently just means excessive, 
unrestrained gratification of our own desires and our own appetites, our own whims. Nothing to do with a dollar amount. It's really a heart, it's really a heart issue. He says it's, it's, it's like that, that, those cattle that are, being, that are being fattened up for the day of slaughter. He's like, you're just feeding yourself, not really realizing. That cow doesn't realize the sooner and the fatter he gets, the sooner he's getting to the slaughterhouse, right? Are we just self-indulgent people? Or do we keep that perspective, like I said, living for eternity, an eternal perspective, not so locked in and tied down to this earth? Our true wealth is made up of the things that we can't carry into eternity. It's all going to stay behind, and I'm going to have to give an account of, to God of what he's placed in my hands. Jesus said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How many of you have ever had moths eat your clothes? Maybe your house has been destroyed by fire or something. How many of you had a thief break in and steal? I have. Some of you heard just a few weeks ago, we went on vacation in Florida. Not two hours after we landed on the ground, we got our rental car and pulled into a restaurant, came out to see that our vehicle had been broken into. My backpack and Jeannie's backpack were stolen. We had our passports stolen, computers, keys to our vehicles, and uh, countless other things that you don't really realize. How much value is packed in a little tiny bag that you would carry with you? But it's like the rug had been pulled out from under us and we'd been dumped on our heads. Now what do we do? Our, our, our identity's gone. We're here for a vacation. We're meeting family. We're supposed to be uh, leaving with our passports and now we can't, we can't do it. And all of a sudden, it's, that day is like a blur and it was just a complicated uh, set of circumstances that when I look back and I see God totally had his hand on our lives, there was not one of us that was injured. All the stuff that was taken while it was difficult, it's all, it's all replaceable. It's just stuff. That was some of the more important things that we have in our life. And I came to this realization that it's all stuff. And it, if it can be replaced, guess what? The value of it really just kind of goes down. My family is, was uninjured. That could have turned out so much differently, we could have been held up at gunpoint. If I had come out and seen a, a thief breaking into my car, you know what I probably would have done? I would have shouted him down and started running after him because he's got my stuff. And I could have lost my life because of stuff. What's most important? What has the most value in life? When we invest in the things of earth, our hearts are going to be set on earth. When we invest in heaven, guess what? That's where our heart's going to be. And so my final question is this, and I close with this. Where is your heart? Ask yourself this question. Where is my heart as it relates to this topic, this subject? Money is such a huge part of our life. Stuff and things are such a huge part of our life. We invest ourselves so much here. But as we close, I want to read this passage of Scripture from Luke. Jesus said, someone, uh, it says, someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell me, tell my brother to divide my father's estate with me. And Jesus replied to him, Friend, who made me a judge over you and to decide such things as that? And he said, Beware. Guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. And then he told them a story. He said a rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. And he said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. And then he said, I know. I will tear my barns down and build bigger ones. And then I'll have room enough to store all of my wheat and my other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, friend, You have enough stored away for yourself for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. You will die this very day, and then who will get everything that you've worked for? Verse 21, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. And so the question is, where is my heart? Are you rich toward God or are you richer toward things? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? It's a heart matter and it's all about Jesus. It's not about money. It's not about amounts. 
It's about your heart. What Jesus gives us is more important than what we could ever give him. Have you accepted his free gift of salvation? Have you trusted Jesus with your life? If not, I want to encourage you today to respond to him. And so with every head bowed and eye closed, as I look across the room here, and you would say, I need to give my life to Jesus. I want him to have my life. I want his gift of eternal life. If that's you this morning, with every head bowed and eye closed, would you just raise your hand and say, pray with me? Pray for me, Pastor Jeff. Thank you. If you'd raise your hand and just keep it raised for just a moment. And I pray for you this morning as, as you responded to him. And just pray a prayer like this, Lord, I invite you into my life. Would you come and have all of me? I realize that you are the giver of life and you're the giver of every good thing. And Jesus, you came to earth to die so that I might have real life, eternal life. And I accept that free gift of salvation today. And I give you my life for you to have your way in me. I don't want to invest in the things of this earth as much as I'm investing in the things of eternity. I want to store up my treasure in heaven with you. If you prayed that prayer today, I encourage you to talk to one of the pastors or stop at the Fresh Start Center because you're beginning to start a journey that changes your focus and direction of life and it's all of a sudden not everything's going to be perfect but it's all going to kind of make better better sense so we'd love to pray with you 